this is something I've done um, quite a bit more recently is, is whenever I'm studying a text is I'll find a place where I can copy it into a, a Word document so that I can move it around a little bit. So let's uh, listen to this ancient letter. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is it is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me, so that he could take, my pl take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while was, was that you might have uh, him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, even dear to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. If you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will, pay, I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your, your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demoth, and Demas, and Luke my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There's just a few of us on today, so feel free to unmute, but um, tell me what you think about this letter. You've read it before, but now we got to read it again. So was Timothy then a slave as well? Is that how they got so close? I don't know. He doesn't mention that Timothy's in jail with him. And so Timothy, Timothy may in fact uh, be potentially part of the messenger system to get this letter between the two. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't mention that Timothy's in jail. He does mention, which is interesting at the end, is that Epaphras is in jail with him. And we know Epaphras from the Colossian letter because he's the, he's the minister or the one that Paul sent to Colossae to help found that church. So this would obviously seem to be a later, time, later in history than uh, Colossians. Because in Colossians, it appears that Epaphras is still active in ministry. Karen, did you say something a few moments ago? You're on mute. I, I saw your lips moving, but I didn't hear your words. But, Are you but talking you, about me, Karen Brown? Yeah, or the yeah you're the only Karen today. Um, I was just wondering about the word church. Um, somebody told me that means a gathering. So when they were um, 
saying that you meet the church meets in your home? Are they saying the gathering of the gathering of people in the home? Yeah, the word church is really tricky today because of the modern connotations that we've put into it. But in the first century, it generally means a, a group of people that have that are together largely for a like minded reason. And so uh, the word that's being used there, which is unfortunate for us, is not even a churchy word. It's the normal word you would use for a gathering of people. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, it is ecclesia, and church is probably not a bad translation, except it really creates kind of an image for us of a building structures and all of those things. And so, so basically, the greeting here is to the folks who believe in Jesus that are gathering regularly in this place. Is that helpful, Karen? Yes, thank you. Also, soldier, soldier. Yeah. Does that? Yeah. That uh, kind of interesting soldier. <laughs> yeah, the early Christians, while largely um, pacifistic in the sense that they, they wouldn't harm anybody if they could, um, often used military language as a descriptor for being in mission. Which I think is interesting that a group de dedicated to peace uses military images for how they move through time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. You're quite welcome. One of the things I walk away from uh, from this letter is what is Paul actually asking for? It's a letter of petition. Yeah. Cindy, just jump in there. Yeah, I see that um, he's had a slave that has run away from his home, uh, Philemon. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, so he's now become a brother. Somehow he's crossed paths with Paul. Yeah. And so Paul wants to send him back and ask that Philemon would receive him yep. on level playing grounds, no longer as his slave, but as a brother. Uh huh. And of course, Philemon has the rights to punish this man for, uh -huh. you know, Philemon running away, but Paul's asking for a favor that he might not do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that. Uh, do you think he's actually uh, asking for um, Onesimus to be set free? Yeah, because doesn't he say like, hey, like I could just keep him, but I won't. I'll give him back to you and hope you give him to me voluntarily because that means more than me enforcing it. Okay, so he would still be a slave then if... if uh if Onesimus was sent back to Paul. See, this is one of the interesting things about this letter is because you would think that the language would imply re release him from slavery. But Paul doesn't actually believe that whether you're a slave or not a slave has, has any bearings on your ultimate relationship in Christ. And so um, while it's entirely possible that Onesimus is set free, we don't know that the early Christians generally worked at... Um, they didn't, they didn't put their main energy in releasing slaves. We do have some stories of Christians helping slaves later on, helping slaves buy their freedoms because slaves could make money in the ancient world. The other thing I think which is uh, challenging for reading Philemon is that we've been um, um, largely coached in or trained in thinking of slavery in the kind of the modern North American terms and slavery in the ancient world, uh, while still slavery, you should never ever say that slavery is not slavery, but it's different because in the ancient world, uh, slaves were often um, the spoils of war. And so in, 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 and so it's only in the modern era, say it's from the, about the 1500s, that you can truly that, uh, say that slavery was really um, race-based. That is, it was based on the skin color. In the ancient world, you've got some of that, but it's not the basis of skin colors because the Romans actually took over the Greeks. And so they ended up with slaves that were often their teachers and their doctors, and they continued to use them in that way. Yeah, and so, and so... It was the spoils of war. Go ahead, Cindy. And also, didn't people sell themselves into slavery to pay off debts? 
Yeah, and that's also true in in, in uh, the modern, at least modern British system, where indentured uh, servitude was possible. But yes, that often happened. And if you were in debt, being a slave was better than going to jail. At least you could work your way. You could kind of work your way back. Yeah, there's all kinds of stories uh, in the ancient world about how one might become a slave, but generally it was the result of war. Whoever won the war got the slaves. And people that you wouldn't typically think of in kind of the modern sense as slaves are actually the slaves in the ancient world. So they can be highly competent people in terms of skills and skill sets and learning and, and those kind of things. Jenna, I, I see your I see your mind twirling there. Well, I was just wondering, so is it in this first century here, is it just like in the Old Testament times where the slaves, like every, what is it, year of Jubilee, they'd have the chance of being set free or staying or were the, was that still happening? Well, that, that should have been happening among the Jews, whether it actually did or not is a little hard to prove, but it certainly wasn't happening among the Romans, the Greeks and the other cultures. Yeah. And, uh, but, but the Romans also under, uh, the Romans also had laws protecting slaves to a degree. By the way, slaves are, um, are high-level property in the ancient world. And so it was generally in the best interest of owners to take care of their slaves because of what it did for what good it brought. So, so there's kind of built-in, kind of a built-in security. The other thing we have to remember is that in the ancient Roman system, even if you weren't a slave, you probably had a patron. You probably had somebody above you or stronger than you that you relied on. And so slavery was kind of like the bottom rung of the entire patronage system in which uh, ultimately the Caesar is the top of the pyramid. And so everybody's in that arrangement. And, and, and you find Paul negotiating an interesting relationship with Philemon here is Paul is actually claiming to be an equal and also a superior you owe me your very life. And so the language there, which is really strange to us in some ways, is the language of client patron. It, it's kind of the standard way that, so everybody had somebody they depended on. And I say all of that to say that slavery did provide uh, social security for some people, if I can use that language. Because there is no social insurance kind of package at all in the ancient world unless you were attached to somebody who could take care of you. And so the, uh, the slave system, while cruel at times, was also the safety net. Somebody needed to take care of you. So, yeah, it's quite complex. But the truth is, is that if, um, if Philemon wants to kill Onesimus, he could do it and there would be no repercussions. It was still, it, the slave was still property. But some of the same relationships attached to the children, their own children, and the wife, while not a slave, also found herself in that kind of odd pyramid, not at the top, usually. Yeah. You know. So there's a lot that you can learn about ancient slavery, I think, that helps make this uh, understandable. By the way, I did send out a, um, another letter that was by uh, Plinius Secundus, Pliny. Mm -hmm. And it gives you, a, a, I'm not going to go into it today, but, but it gives you a first century parallel to Philemon to, to let you know that, that the letter we have in front of us that's part of our Bible actually is a part of fabric of the ancient culture. I mean, it's, it's very consistent with something you would read in the ancient world. It wasn't an unprecedented problem. Yeah. But Roman law certainly, certainly uh, favored the owner, the patron, not the client. I want to do a little bit of just uh, how do you read, and again, um, I use this, this is the letter that I use to help people uh, get a sense of how to read all New Testament letters. And so in reading this, one of the first things that I do is I try to isolate the body. And so it's, again, it's fairly simple to do with this letter, but it's a good skill because you're going to need to do it with other letters. All ancient letters 
And again, let me highlight it. You should be able to see it. All ancient letters had this at the beginning of the letter, basically the writer to the recipient. And so the writer here, notice Paul has a co-writer, but the writer is Paul, essentially. By the way, when we get into the letter, it's first person, right? So it's, it's in Paul's voice. And then the recipient is um, Philemon. But there's also other recipients listed, but we become very clear that it's a single person. Uh, when we start reading the letter, it is not, not all of these people are the direct or directly being addressed. And so we have Philemon, and then we have descriptors. We'll, we'll break those down here in a bit. Scholars have really struggled with Aphia and Archippus and exactly who they are. Is, is Aphia Philemon's wife? Is she Archippus's wife? Or would it be more appropriate to say that she's one of the ministers of the little church that meets in your home, in Philemon's home? So is she being called forth because she's a wife? Or is she being called forth because she's one of the leaders? And I'm leaning more and more towards that second option the more I get to know first century uh, particularly the first century church. Why does Paul draw names? I think largely the names help him make his case with Philemon. Would that make sense? So that he mentions Timothy because Timothy means something to Philemon. Timothy's also with him, so he's not making it up, but but the other thing is, is while we may not be able to figure out who Aphia and Archippus, by the way, Archippus' name shows up in other of Paul's letters. So um, he mentions these other names, Aphia and Archippus, because they put some kind of pressure on Philemon to fulfill what Paul's asking. It's as, as if Paul's having a private conversation with Philemon and he, say, he sees he sees Aphia and Archippus on the dance floor and he says, hey, you guys come over here. We've got a conversation going. So you might want to be part of this conversation. But the greeting is also made to the whole church, that is, and to the church that meets in your home and to the gathered community. The next thing that occurs in a letter is some kind of greeting, and, there, and we have it. By the way, grace and peace would have been typical greetings in the first century. As you've heard me say, what makes it Christian is this part here, right? There's nothing uniquely Christian about this. Any ancient person could say that to each other. What makes it Christian is Paul's additive phrases. So, so this letter is very much following what we would expect to find in an ancient letter. We would expect, you know, the author to the recipient. We'd expect a line of greeting. And then what happens next in the letter is usually a prayer wish or a thanksgiving. And certainly these verses here satisfy that. So once you've done that much work, at best, you can say, we think the body, they'll notice the therefore there in verse 8, connecting it to the previous. The body probably starts in verse 8. That's because I've been able to identify the previous parts. Everybody kind of following the logic there? Now, the next thing to do is scroll to the end of the letter, which I literally get to scroll this letter. Where does Paul end up with his final greetings. I'm going to say at the very best, it may be earlier. It may include this verse 22. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me. That still sounds like body stuff. But certainly by the time we hit verse 23, we've hit final stuff, the final greetings. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. So obviously Epaphras is sitting there with him. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. 
Um, there's a lot of stuff we could say beyond the letter. Mark is, of course, John Mark. Aristarchus is one of the Greeks. Demas is somebody that's going to leave Paul later. We know that from uh, 1st, 2nd Timothy. And then Luke is with him at the end. So I think this letter probably would date to about 62. It's probably his Roman imprisonment. So. And the grace of our Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Does anybody have a footnote on that? Your, because if I remember right, it is a plural. As if he's closing it out to everybody that's included in the letter. Give me just a second. I'll look. Yep. And that last, that last uh, you is plural. So it, it does appear that Paul intends for this letter to be read to the entire church. That while it may be to Philemon, he does anticipate that the entire church is listening in on it. Which would give us, now that we've kind of isolated the end matter, would give us basically from verse 8 to verse 22 being the body. We may, we may decide what to, uh, to change that here in a minute, but it gives us something. The reason we want to isolate the body is, is basically uh, twofold. It's we want to hit the main point, but if the letter is a petition, what the writer is asking for will show up in the body but the other parts of the letter will be then begin to support what he's asking for. Jenna, you got something going there? Am I missing anything? Well, you're not that you would have seen, but I'm glad you brought it up because Karen and I were private messaging and we had both missed the same thing. Um, and we're curious when you mark that was a disciple, like who was, we missed that. Oh, Mark is Mark. Mark is John Mark, whom Paul and Paul separated from him and Barnabas. He's a, he's a cousin of or a nephew of Barnabas. And so this is John Mark, and this is the Mark that's attributed with to uh, have written the first gospel. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, great that's, that you asked that right then. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of character studies that go beyond the reading of the letter that are just really interesting and following what little we know about John Mark is actually really interesting. So let me back up to something else that I want to show you. When the writer says that I urge you or I appeal to you, these words are quite important to getting to the, um, the heart of what the writer is asking for. Most New Testament letters are what we call petitions. They're actually asking the readers to do something, to be something, to think something. And when you find that statement, it makes sense of everything else in it. And again, I think Philemon is somewhat simple for us here, except for this. Paul starts his appeal statement in verse 8, but he actually doesn't get to it until verse 17. Which leads me to believe that uh, Paul recognized the sensitivity of what he's asking and he's building up to the big ask. Paul could have written this as, I appeal to you to welcome him as you would welcome me. And if I'm right that this is the petition, then this becomes the, this becomes the controlling statement on everything else that's in the letter. It's what the letter's designed to get done. We may, because we don't know what happened next, we may struggle with exactly what that is, but we do know what Paul is asking. Paul is at least, at least asking that Onesimus be welcomed as, as uh, Philemon would welcome Paul. 
And by the way, that welcome word is kind of the major key word in a lot of Paul's writing about how Jews and Gentiles ought to accept one another and how we ought to accept one another because Christ has accepted us. And so in some sense, this letter continues the big theme that that you've probably heard me highlight is that the New Testament is largely about the grand hospitality of God. The great welcome of God. Yeah. But I want to kick out of the Word document for just a bit. And I want us to go back. To, uh, I want us to take a look at how these petition statements um, uh, sometimes some, some scholars call them disclosure statements. It's where Paul says something like, I want you to know or I urge you to, where he kind of highlights. I want to show you how it functions in a couple of, of letters. So let me, let me leave this. I'm, so I'm going to stop share. And then I'm going to go into another program. So I can just get us some biblical text in front of us. We won't need the Greek here. And I want to show you a couple of samples of how helpful it is to isolate this statement. And what we're looking at here is 1 Corinthians, and we have the typical stuff we're looking for, right? We have the author to the recipient, and then we have the greeting, and then we have the thanksgiving or prayer wish, which is what we typically expect. And then somewhere Paul's going to start the body, and Paul starts 1 Corinthians with, he starts 1 Corinthians with a disclosure statement or a petition. Maybe petition might be the best way. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. What's important about this statement is that it becomes, again, like I said, it becomes the controlling statement for the entire document. The rest of 1 Corinthians can virtually be outlined around things that divide people. Now, if you've done 1 Corinthians, you've seen this before. But what we've often not seen is that Paul's very clear about what he's trying to do here. And you can actually begin the re- to read the letter. What is Paul trying to do? He's trying to help this church have no division among them and to be united in mind and thought. And you can basically outline the rest of the material along that line. In fact, you can actually read the previous material as supporting that point. Okay. This one's fairly easy because it puts it at the beginning. Sometimes Paul will need to, or at least he he believes he needs to build something of a case before he gets to the petition. Folks have really struggled to read Romans because the content is so dense and so theologically rich. I want to show you where Paul's petition is in Romans. It doesn't show up until chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, which, by the way, is catching the theme of mercy in the previous chapter, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your proper and true worship. If I'm right about what Paul's doing, this is actually the point of the first 11 chapters. It's to lay the foundation for this kind of living. And the rest of Romans begins to just basically expand on what this kind of living looks like. So folks who are reading Romans as if it's Paul's kind of grand theological treatise is probably misreading Romans. Romans is really simply a call for Christians in Rome to live sacrificial lives for Jesus. And so it gives you a prism with which to read the letter through. 
And if you keep coming back to this, some of the materials that didn't make sense begins to make sense. The reason that one of the ways to know that you've really kind of landed on, on the, the thesis material, as we would call it in modern writing, is that it tends to make sense of the rest. It also puts, it also puts interpretive controls around the text. So the text can't mean anything. The text is serving the purpose of whatever the primary statement is. And so it, it still allows us to disagree on lots of content stuff like that could mean this, could mean that. But what it doesn't allow us to do is on the main point, like what is, what is the purpose of Romans? Well, the purpose of Romans is to help believers live offering your bodies as living sacrifices kind of lives. Okay, let me show you one more. Some letters are also very hard because they don't always have, not all of Paul's letters, not all of the New Testament letters have clear statements like this. But when they do, it, it does help you read the letter uh, much more sharply. One of my favorites is the one that shows up in 1 Peter 2. And it's in verse 11 and 12. So notice you get kind of the discourse marker, dear friends, like, hey, listen up. I'm about to change directions. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. Live such good lives among the unbelievers, pagans, Gentiles, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, that uh, th that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So what is Paul or what is Peter asking his readers to do? Live good lives in the presence of those who don't live good lives. But here's something else that uh, I find interesting is that Verse 11 here sums up what's already been said. And you might remember that what, what's been said earlier is be holy as I am holy. So it's a call to holiness. Notice how verse 11 is kind of a summary of what that means. It's a call to holiness. And verse 12 calls on the, the believers to live good lives among the unbelievers so that when God comes, they might actually participate in that. So the hope here is that folks will turn to God because of the way we're living among them. But verse 12 basically is a good header statement for the rest of the letter. Everything else that shows up in the letter is about how to live this good life among the unbelievers. And so basically here, you've got an out, that's your basic outline for the first part of the book. And that's your basic outline for the second part of the book. And so notice that what these things do is they give you some boundaries for this is how we ought to read this letter. Okay, I'll, I'll leave any others that show up in the New Testament to you, but I've given you enough illustration that when, when, when the writer says, I urge you to do something, now it doesn't necessarily have to be the main theme, so be careful with this because the writer can make a sub point. I urge you to live good lives later. That's not the main point of the letter. So, so, but when these things show up well, like Ephesians 4 1, they really do, they really do help you read the letter in a much, um, a much more focused way. So let's take a few moments to see how um, the pieces might serve the purpose of the petition in Philemon. I think I'll continue to do this. So let me go back to, hang on, let me, let me switch screens again and go back to that word dot so that we've... Uh,
let's go back and just quickly kind of walk through the letter and see how how the whole letter seems to serve the purpose of getting us to this point to welcome Onesimus as one would welcome Paul. Let's go back to the beginning. So I'm going to pick up in verse four. Let's pick up with the Thanksgiving. I always thank my, thank my God as I remember you because I hear of your love for all of God's holy people. Notice how he's laying the foundation here. You love all of God's people. Guess who that includes? Okay, good. And your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us, notice the us there ties in Timothy. So we got this thing going on between us that we pray that your partnership with us in faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share, things we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because your, you, brother, have refreshed the heart of God's people or the Lord's people. Refresh the heart. Hold on to the word refreshed and see if we see that one again. Therefore, and this is where Paul begins his really long, really long build up to finally get to the position. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you uh, to do what you ought to do. By the way, does Paul introduce himself as an apostle? No, he doesn't introduce himself as an apostle, but a prisoner. So that's interesting. Therefore, I could in Christ order you to do what you ought to do. That's pretty good. That's really all he has to say, but he said, yeah, I prefer to appeal, uh, to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than Paul, an old man. By the way, one of the textual variants here, because this is the word presbyteros, which is the word for old man. One, uh, some manuscripts have um, ambassador. I think, I think old man's probably the, 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 the correct reading, but we won't go deeply into that. It's none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner for Christ, that I appeal to you. Again, there's the appeal statement. Notice how many times that he's going to build up to that. To appeal, and again, to appeal. I appeal to you for Onesimus, for my son Onesimus. Who became my son while I was in chains. Became a believer. That's how we typically believe that. And I think it's the right way to really. Formerly, he was useless. And you'll have to have a commentary to hear this. But the word useless is, um, is a play on Onesimus' name. Onesimus means useful. And so he was useless to you. Probably referring to the fact that he ran, he ran away. But now he's become useful to both, to both you and me. Notice how Paul just keeps weaving that. Okay. I am sending him who is my very heart. Let me scroll back one more time. Don't want to give you a vertigo here, folks. But and that he has refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people many times. So Onesimus is my very heart. Back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while in, uh, while in chains, right? But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. I don't know about you. If I received this letter, I'd feel like I had had my arm twisted behind my back. Perhaps, Paul theorizes, the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have them back forever. The perhaps here includes maybe God did this, right? Perhaps. Yeah. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave. Dear, as a dear brother. I've, I've also wondered whether or not Onesimus is getting a little bit of a chiding for not having brought his slave into um, a belief in the gospel, obedience to the gospel. But, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man, that's kind of interesting, as a fellow human, and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. 
If he's done you any wrong or owe you anything, charge it to me. This kind of picks up on the background of Roman law that, that if somebody keeps a runaway slave, they do, in fact, owe the owner the lost labor. So there were laws governing that kind of things in the ancient world. I don't know if Paul's using a scribe for the letter, and it's at this point or this paragraph that he actually picks up the pen, which he often does because he doesn't seem to have been a professional scribe because in his other letters, he's actually using a scribe. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. But he's basically, Paul's take, writing the letter and saying, this is my IOU for, to, for this debt. So Paul's assuming the debt. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I don't know if Paul physically saved his life or if he's talking about having shared the gospel with him, which is the way most commentators go. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Did you follow the play on the word refresh now? Onesimus has refreshed the Lord's people, the heart of the Lord's people. Onesimus is Paul's very heart. Refresh my heart in Christ. Yeah. Jenna, you need to go back and see all of those places or you got it? You got it. Okay, good. Confidence of your obedience. I don't know if obedience is the right translation of the word uh, between equals. So I'm wondering if uh, confident of your compliance might actually be the better translation in English here. But confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Do you see how everything in the letter now is serving the purpose of that statement right there? And you end up with a much sharper reading of the letter and a much clearer understanding. Even if you don't know what the implications are, you do understand uh, what's being asked in this particular letter. Let me, uh, verse 22 has been called uh, by scholars visit talk. And it's more than just asking a favor of a guest room. It's saying, would you please do this? And oh, by the way, I'm coming to see you. Yeah. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you Notice how restored is a synonym to the word refresh. I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. I don't know if that ever happened. By the way, visit talk is simply a way that a writer says, uh, let's get on, let's get this thing done. And oh, by the way, I'm coming to see you. Yeah, so get it done before I get there. It's kind of what... And, and you'll see Paul do this with the Corinthians. He says, do you want me to come uh, si uh, quietly or do you want me to carry a big stick? You know, it's visit talk. Yeah. It's like telling your kids to clean their room and saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to be up there in a few minutes. So. And there we have Philemon as I think one of one of the reasons I like to start with Philemon is because most of us don't have a lot of theological uh, concerns growing out of Philemon. We don't have a lot of our theological stakes built in Philemon, although it's quite theological. In fact, I think it's core theologically towards the welcome of God, but because we don't have a lot of doctrines hanging on it, it gives us a chance to step back and say, how would you read a New Testament letter? And here's my suggestion. We ought to read every New Testament letter this way first. Otherwise, we make immediate applications that have no bearing whatsoever and are, will not be helpful to our modern situation. What we, what, if we think of the New Testament as, as a church manual, then everything we find there should find some, some application. 
what if the application is not about how we do things, but how we think about things? For example, Fleeman gives us a way of thinking about other people that we often have to be reminded of. This is how we, this is how we care for other people. Well, but they're not as important. Doesn't matter. This is how Christians take care of people. And so I find a lot of really good theology here, but there's not a lot of doctrinal church manual kind of stuff like, oh, by the way, make sure you do baptisms this way. So what would happen is that you would read all of Paul's letters or all of the New Testament letters in this fashion. That is, you'd simply try to understand what it was trying to get done in the future. For example, we, we have a direct command here that everybody would agree cannot possibly apply to us. Nor was it intended to apply to us. But it's in the New Testament and it is a command. So we can, I think, make some secondary applications out of it. The early Christians provided hospitality for one another. It's one of the ways that they were, we can still do that today, right? Yeah, so we can make, we can make the general comparison. But literally, there's nothing in this letter that was intended for me personally at the personal level. Can I learn some things from it? Yes. Can I learn that how we ought to welcome one another? Yes. Yeah. And so, so I always like kind of the, uh, for application, I like the two-step approach, which is try to understand the letter on its own terms and then have a different conversation about how what we've discovered in this letter impacts the life of the church today. And then we're not caught trying to just imitate everything that we find in the letters, whether they apply or not. Because once I realized that prepare, that prepare a guest room for me is not specifically to me, I'm also free to go into the other epistles and realize greet one another with a holy kiss may not be the exact application to me. So we listen to, we listen to everything with kind of a two-step move. And so, so we're going to do a Texas two-step in order to interpret scripture in a way that doesn't make the way we sometimes have read scripture is we make it a, um, a straight jacket instead of, instead of the guidance that it was intended. Scripture has been preserved to us to guide us into the future. And the primary core of scripture, particularly New Testament scripture, is become like Jesus. And let's talk about what it means to become like Jesus. That's kind of the journey of the New Testament. All right, folks, we have done uh, just short of an hour and we've looked at Philemon. If you've got any questions about content, listen, there's some great stuff to read. I would encourage you to read anything that you can about slavery in the ancient Greco Roman world, just so that you got a, a good sense. Slavery is against the background. I'm left, with, I'm left with some theological personal quandaries. For example, when Paul says that there's neither. Uh, Greek nor Jew, male nor female, slave or free. It seems Paul spent a lot of energy on there's neither uh, Jews nor Greeks or Jews nor Gentiles, but he didn't spend as much time on those other ones. And outside of Philemon, we don't see Paul spending a lot of his energy trying to free slaves because he understood that slaves still had all blessings in Christ, whether they were slaves or not slaves. And Paul only hints at, at some of the stuff that uh, he believes about men and women in Christ. And he seems only to give quick, uh, quick instructions to churches that are having problems with it. And it does seem to be Paul's addressing problem situations in those places. But Paul spends a vast amount of energy, and maybe, maybe he taught, he's dealing with what he considers the biggest one in front of him, is that Jews and, and Gentiles are having a hard time accepting each other in Christ. Mm -hmm.